Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. I hope it doesn't get loud. I'm at the midnight time, so I might even growl. It's very tough to follow uh, Lorenzo and Stefano, but I'll try. My disclosures are I'm working at the University of Maryland Medical Center. We are 13 hospital systems. However, we don't catch up to Yeshoda Hospital's smallest hospital of 2,500 beds. So I'm also the fellowship program director, and I may have a little different opinion or viewpoint than Stefano, and I'll share that with you guys. <laughs> if you look at this slide, Stefano and Felix Earth asked the question, what is IP? And I think this is at a very metacognitive level that they are talking about. And if you read their article carefully, it talks about bronchoscopy. And while the Europeans are talking about what is IP, the Americans have moved very fast and we talk about IP as a rapidly evolving field that involves diseases of the lung, parenchyma, airways, and pleura. And I'll add that it is a multidisciplinary specialty. If you look at the competence, we have defined, and there was a lot of argument when we were defining the competence level, and we looked at the institutional numbers, not the individual numbers. And these numbers are going to be different in India because Hari can do uh, about 100 rigid bronchoscopies in one month where we, we are probably doing in a year. So again, how do we define competency? And that's the question we'll be talking about. There's also a question, what should be included in the IP? Should percutaneous tracheostomy be included in the IP? Percutaneous ultrasound guided gastrostomy or endoscopic guided gastrostomy tubes? There are a lot of centers that are doing it. I would simplify that. If you look at most IP fellowships in the United States, they are basically conglomerate or themes of multidisciplinary care in lung cancer. That's the therapeutic aspect on the top left corner. Or you have lung cancer staging diagnosis, early diagnosis and treatment, or multimodality treatment options. And the international pulmonologist is the facilitator of all this care in the conundrum. And Bobby Mahajan talked a lot about that last night. But it is true, we are not just international pulmonologists, we are oncopulmonologists. And then you have complex airway disease, benign causes, trache uh, tracheostomy-related tracheal stenosis, intubation-related tracheal stenosis, and a big component of our practice is pleural diseases. Fast forward, we have come 10 years of board certification in the United States, and the 10th year is coming up this year. So we have made a lot of progress. This is a recent announcement made by AB. We have evolved in the past four decades from this apprenticeship model where you see someone doing it, and like Stefano pointed, you're seeing through the optics, but your, your uh, mentee cannot understand what you're seeing. They understand partially what you're doing, but you can't provide them a platform to experience it full fledged. This does work in certain trade professions, like being a car mechanic, or um, learning more about um, how to tailor things or fix things. In the United States, we have clearly moved to a competency-based. If you look at the apprenticeship model, that's what you see on this. A pulmonary fellow having confidence, a general pulmonologist having confidence, but not an objective reassessed skill set compared to interventional pulmonologists who's trained in a structured training as just pointed out. What is competency-based training? And this is a model all graduate medical education programs in the United States is taking um, into account. Competency is very simple. It integrates your knowledge, skills, values, and attitude. It is not just your manual skill that we are talking about. I always tell my fellows, if you can shepherd my patient, 
you will be the first one to get all the skills because I can dumb down and deconstruct the skill set for you. And how do we do that? We'll talk a little bit about it. It's not just the competency. We need to measure this competency through milestones. Has somebody got to a point A or point B where should, they should be in three months? Are they able to drive a bronchoscope coaxially into all segments? Can they identify all segments? Can they, can they drive the ebiscope in left and right mainstem with ease? And so these milestones can be established and that's the direction we are moving. And lastly, the question we have to ask, can I refer this, this doctor or can I refer my family member to this doctor that I'm training and how do I achieve that? This is our fellow on the right side of the slide. He's trying to run percutaneous tracheostomy and he wanted to do bronchoscopically. The first thing I told him to identify the landmarks in a cadaver and I made him do 20 punctures at the second ring multiple times without the bronchoscopic view. And then after each puncture, I would ask him to do the bronchoscopy to see if he was in the middle, middle being the 12 o'clock. And that actually honed his haptic feedback skill set to then go to the next level. And everybody is different. Stefano pointed very well. There are some people who have the bent of mind, but there are others who take some time. They also have very different learning attributes. If you have children, you'll notice that two of your children, or three, if they are born on a different timeline, they have very different skill sets. They have very different strengths. You cannot do a randomized, well-defined control study on your kids to double up same skill set. It's just not possible. So how, do you, how does one train individuals in these circumstances? You can do simulation and learning. Lorenzo mentioned he did a, you know, he has a master's program and he's implementing all types of simulation and learning. We know that there are assessment tools that differentiate a novice, intermediate, and an expert. Expert being in this EBASTAT assessment tool as someone who has done more than 100 procedures. Not only it does differentiate, but Agarwal and colleagues from PGI Chandigarh have shown that you can actually use this to, uh, before, the, before the trainee gets to a patient. They, they, can, they can develop some learning, uh, they can, uh, they can uh, go through the learning curve and get certain skill set to be able to get on the patient. If that is achievable, can you do more? And that's the question we ask. What is fascinating while I was preparing this talk is this is an old paper from um, uh, the Calgary group, where they asked their respiratory therapist who was helping them with the bronchoscopy to be the proctor. There was absolutely no difference when they looked at the primary outcome of um, just the procedure time and ability to sample lymph nodes. All of the fellows who were proctored by a respiratory therapist who had some experience did as well as the fellows who were proctored by the interventional pulmonologist. So what does this tell you? I think I would challenge that if you deconstruct a procedure and individuals do deliberate practice, and, and I'm glad Stefano mentioned about that, bringing the music in, so that really helps me. I'll share with you a very simple example of deliberate practice and deconstructing of a procedure. So here you see a picture. Our fellow was struggling to manage both the bronchoscope and the endotracheal tube together. The endotracheal tube would get pushed down because this is a coupled system. All we had to do was take a picture, show them that they have to put a finger underneath the circuit right here to, to brace it, provide understanding that if they have a pincer grip and the other fingers are not uh, creating a barrier for the free movement, they can actually better perform the bronchoscopy. Once you deconstruct, they understand the concept, they go back, practice on a low fidelity or high fidelity um, uh, simulator, they do much better. Another example that we use in our education with the, the, the foundational course of bronchoscopy for incoming fellows is to help them drive the bronchoscope coaxially. 
what does it mean? How do I teach them that the airway is not a straight cylinder? Everybody thinks that I have to just go straight down. How do they manage the handlebar function, which is the steering wheel of the bronchoscope? And to do so, we had to think a little bit. How do I demonstrate it? So the first they understand the concept. So I took a very simple row fidelity model, the mannequin that's available. This is a mold of a cadaver, trachea, and you can see it's not a straight cylinder. So I just superimposed a cylinder, showed them an axis, and said, as you're driving, just remember it's not a straight cylinder. These are multiple cylinders connected with a different axis. So if there are 17 tracheal rings, you have 17 tracheal axes. If you understand that concept, most of the medical students are bright enough to know. They wouldn't be in medical school if they can't understand axis of a cylinder. I, I doubt that would be the case. Once they have an understanding of geometric axis, we broke it down to the vocal cord, anterior tracheal wall, showed them that if the scope is driving through the vocal cord and they go forward without using the handlebar function, they are going to probably move forward. The anterior wall is going to come in the way and they're going to hit that and as they hit, they're going to withdraw back. The patient is going to cough. You're going to be out of the airway. Once they understand the concept, they start turning the handlebar as they are approaching the vocal cords. If they understand that, they, they are better able to drive the scope during that motion, and they have developed the under haptic understanding of how much force it needs. Once you have that understanding, you keep moving forward. Of course, when it comes to right and left, we all get confused where to go first. <clears throat> One more time, this is another example where there is a some type of tracheal stenosis that is actually in the way, and you then demonstrate how to navigate around or away from it. And when they have this concept, they are able to better perform during the actual patient. You also have to share with them the rational and reason for what you are doing. Uh, if the procedures require a higher skill set, such as lining up the balloon in a bleeding airway, you are only going to be able to do it if your axes are lined up. They need to understand where the exit point of the working channel is. You have to show them why it's important to prevent trauma. You have to show them how they can do extended working channel or drive through the airways uh, with ease if that happens or if that's needed. And above all, they need positive reinforcement. This was a very simple example where you all have experience when you have to close a cylinder, you always do the opposite direction. So I made a cookie for our staff that shows righty tighty, lefty roozy. And that was a fun way to make them remember what they need to do. But fundamentally, what makes a difference as humans to adopt new things is this deliberate practice. On the left-hand side is the tabla master, Zaki Hussain. And if you look at a very old literature, if you ask the best students what is their leisure time, it almost matches up when they actually document versus what they think their leisure time was or the amount of time spent in deliberate practice. If you ask good students, you'll see that their perception is very different. Of course, their teachers are worse. But we know that if you put enough time, not just time as number of hours as in this curve, but deliberate practice, you're gonna do well. You may not become the, the uh, the opera singer that you want to be, but you're gonna be much, much better at a rapid pace. And if you have um, the bent of mind, and I think most medical students, pulmonologists do, they can achieve that. What is common among these three? Michael Jordan, Sachin Tendulkar, and P.V. Sindhu. How many are here from Hyderabad? Your own P.V. Sindhu. I think the common thing is deliberate practice. The same principle applies to the pulmonary critical care fellows and interventional pulmonary fellows. The interventional pulmonary curriculum and the opportunity to practice this under mentors or educators gives you this advantage of number of hours. If I could quantify one bronchoscopy as one hour and I go back and do reflection on this, 
I can achieve a lot more. But what is deliberate practice? It is not just the autonomous function of learning a new task, which I can teach you in a simulator env environment or a cadaver environment, but it is this cognitive associated behavior where you actually do a situation analysis, you assess, you say, what do I need to remedy or modify? And then you take it back. Then you re-modify, you get feedback. Then you take it back, you continuously improve. If you can do that, you can achieve a lot. And I can tell you, I have two boys. One was great with the keyboard uh, throughout his you know, elementary school and so on. The other one was terrible with a trumpet, but we made him, we talked to him, we said, I understand music is not your first love, but what we want you to achieve is these baby steps to go to the next, go to the next, just for the purpose of going through this process. And believe it, me, believe it or not, from sixth grade until ninth grade, he actually played a pretty decent trumpet so we could actually not feel bad that something bad is going on with the trumpet. To summarize, the deliberate in the deliberate practice model, the task has to be well-defined. You have to be motivated. You can't be a deflated learner who's coming in thinking that I can achieve anything I want. And then you have to provide plenty of opportunities. A simplest rule of opportunity is you tell them what they need to do. You tell them what you told them, then you go back and tell them again what you told them. If you do this three to four times and they, uh, they, they get that feedback, they are going to do a lot better. I'm, I'm eager to hear what Mike Pritchard has to talk about the virtual reality, but we have a lot of tips and um, uh, tricks to help the learners. Above all, it's very important to have educators who are motivated. Here is a picture of Carl Lamb and Colin Gillespie who were in the cadaver lab for eight and a half hours. Unflinchingly, they were introducing rigid bronchoscope with the learner without touching it, just coaching them. And they were in sweat by the time they took off their gowns and they were still smiling. So if you have those type of educators helping you teach, the learners are enthusiastic to get new skills. This is one of my favorite picture of all time. The person with a blindfold is a thoracic surgery attending now. He was a fellow in 2015. And I don't want to say he started at a very basic level, but regardless, after a month of rotating with interventional pulmonary, my challenge to him was that he should be able to drive the bronchoscope blindfold in an intubated patient with just audio instruction. What I've found is that the more video input they have, the more sensor input, the worse they perform at times. Because they are trying to correct too much. But if they, they, you can invigorate their creative mind where they can start thinking while they don't have too much visual sensory input, they can do perform. He completed a full inspection in less than three minutes. And I said he's, he can do any type of bronchoscopy. Where, how far we have come in the United States, if you look at this graph, when I did my fellowship around 2008, there were only four or five, less than 10 programs, actually no, 2011, sorry. And the number of programs has grown tremendously. We entered a uh, national residency matching program somewhere around this time. We had an interventional pulmonary board exam first time in 2013, and 2023 would be our 10th year. We had AB, A, ABIP, not AB, ABIP, AIPPD accreditation around this time, and we published the documentation. And uh, just now we received ACGME accreditation, and 20, starting 2024, all the United States uh, interventional pulmonary program have to be ACGME accredited. This last year, Interventional pulmonary was the hardest specialty to get into. The number of applicants and the unmatched positions were the second highest in every specialty. So these were the match results. Where does the future lie? We don't know, but we do know that we have so much ability to deconstruct things 
adapt to different learners, and if the AI is going to pass USML exam, which was last week's news, I wonder whether we'll even need doctors or we'll need uh, pulmonologists. But one thing is for sure that any trainee like ours does, does have to do deliberate practice beyond the IP fellowship, and I agree completely, it takes almost five years to mature as an international pulmonologist. <clears throat> this last year, the past year, we did a boot camp for about 50 international pulmonary fellows where they had the opportunity to do cadaver lab and introduce the rigid bronchoscope multiple times under the guidance of an instructor mentor through a structured uh, stepwise approach in a deconstructed model. And they all, at least the feedback, was tremendous. And we are having a full-fledged modified boot camp focusing a lot on the skill set that the interventional pulmonology fellows need. And that, that is something we are going to measure and we'll see. And maybe next year we'll have a, some new report to talk about. So I'm going to thank the organizers, Yeshoda Hospitals and Hari for inviting me. And I, I really appreciate it. I want to hear Stefano's comments. I couldn't find your picture with harmonica, otherwise I'd put that. I think practice without metacognitive thinking or thinking about the thinking becomes a little more of an arrested development. So that's the only difference. And I think that's what we need to tell the learners and expose them to this idea that they have to start thinking differently. Thank you very much.